Okay, so thank you all for uh, for joining us for the second talk today. So we have the pleasure to have uh, Charles Collot uh, from Sergi University, and he will talk about uh, soliton resolution in dimension six for a critical wave equation. So please, Charles. Okay, yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, of course, I want to thank uh, deeply the Thing deeply. Ah, okay. Sorry, I'm like doing something bad with the sound. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me well? Do, or do you yeah. hear an echo? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's all good. Okay, perfect. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the soliton resolution uh, for the energy critical wave equation in six dimensions. And it's a joint work with uh, Thomas Duikert, uh, Carlos Koenig, and Frank Mer. So, uh, um, what, what is the equation? Uh, so, and I don't remember if I already thanks the organizers or not due to this technical problem. So, of course, I thank deeply uh, Neda and Tesh for having invited me uh, to this online conference we, that can gather like people from all around the world. Uh, when I look at the people connecting to each talk, I think it's a really a nice worldwide conference. Um, so, I'm going to consider uh, the focusing critical wave equation uh, in six dimensions. So you can make it be of two kinds. Either you take like this uh, analytical nonlinearity u square, or you can take uh, mod u u. Okay. And uh, then there is a, a generalized version of this equation if you're in any dimension, which is um, with the, this power here that you have to adapt for the dimension. And the reason we take this specific power is that in this case, it, it corresponds to the energy critical case. And so um, you have a, a functional, which is uh, this one here. Uh, which is preserved for solutions. So this quantity is constant with time for any solution. And uh, you have also an invariance for the equation. So you can like rescale time and space and your solution accordingly to form a new solution. And this new solution now lives at typical scale lambda the thing is that for this specific power in the nonlinearity, uh, the energy is invariant by this transformation. And so this is why it's called uh, energy critical. And it has been proved by uh, Gini Bré, uh, Sofa, and Velo uh, some time ago now that you have solutions if you start with uh, data which are in H.1 uh, times L2. Of course, it's a, a wave equation, so you have to prescribe not only uh, U at time zero, but also uh, the partial derivative with time at time zero. Okay, so uh, I think it's a well-known equation uh, and I'm going to study solutions for that. Among solutions, there is a very specific solution, which is the ground state. So you can ask whether or not there are stationary solutions for this equation uh, and they have to solve uh, this um, so is it true that uh, you don't uh, hear my echo because it's just that I did not really find how to completely remove the sound of my iPad. So you're sure it's uh, good, Nader? Oh, it's, it's for, good. For me, it's, it's fine. For uh, me it's either fine. for me also. Oh, then perfect. Okay. Uh, perfect. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay. So, um, okay. So in fact, uh, you, you can find many solutions of this equation as has been showed by uh, Ding uh, in, uh, some time ago. 
And the thing is that if you restrict to the radial case, there is only one solution. And also if you restrict to positive solutions, then by some uh, moving plate techniques, uh, this solution has to be radial. And so it's uh, in this case unique up to the, uh, of course, uh, scaling invariants that we've seen in the previous slide. And there is an explicit formula, which is this one. And uh, we have already encountered uh, such a bubble in the talk, for example, of uh, Yannick Sir uh, yesterday. And um, he, here's one thing is that uh, what could try to prove similar results for also uh, the say supercritical uh, wave equation. And most of these results that I'm gonna describe, they only consider the critical wave equation. And I think that the reason is the following one is that uh, being a borderline between uh, the subcritical case and the supercritical case, the energy critical case is a bit um, degenerate. And one degeneracy is that this stationary solution will decay very fast at infinity. And when I say very fast, of course, it's with respect to uh, the expected decay using the uh, self-similar transformation. And so, uh, of course, there's a missing minus here, so it has to decay. But so th this means that basically uh, interactions with your uh, stationary state far away, they are very small. They are much smaller than, say, dispersive effect due to the wave part of the equation. And so I, I think this is why most uh, work has been done so far in the um, energy critical case, though there are certain works for the supercritical case, but since then uh, the soliton is of uh, infinite critical uh, norm, uh, it's say it's much harder. So there are few results in this case, and for the moment people are mainly focused on the energy critical case. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to focus uh, on the case of the dimension six, and in this case, uh, just to remind you, so you have, of course, uh, the explicit formula given by the above one. And you have to think that basically uh, my soliton is like one at scale one, and then it decays at infinity like x to the uh, minus four. And it's radial. Okay, and so the result uh, is the following. But, so, gonna... Charles, yeah. Charles I, I, always, I have a question. So uh, how do you explain that this w decays faster? Than the scaling invariant. Why? I mean, is, is there like a deeper reason why that's the case? Uh, okay, so what one could try to answer that by means of, uh, uh, I don't know, somehow a, a connection problem, reconnection problem is that. Uh, of course, the scaling invariant solution exists, and there exists like a constant such that if you multiply the scaling invariant uh, solution by a specific constant, it cancels both uh, nonlinear and uh, Laplacian terms here. So, in a sense, there exists a solution which has another decay at infinity. Uh, yeah. But it does not reconnect at zero to something smooth. Mm -hmm. It has to blow up before, while for the supercritical case, uh, it's true. So, okay, so this is rather a technical thing, but uh, than a deep answer. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay, I see. Um, and I think that, okay, maybe more philosophically, it's always this thing that uh, having this um, stationary solution, which uh, uh, decays uh, with the self similar rate at infinity is somehow a stable feature of the supercritical case. While for the subcritical case, you don't have solutions. And so somehow I think it's an argument that, okay, when you leave the open set of supercritical regime, since in the subcritical regime, you don't have solutions anymore, something uh, abrupt my, has to happen at the boundary because uh, you will go to a completely different uh, uh, regime for the elliptic problem. Mm. Um, okay. okay, so uh, 
the result is the following. Uh, I'm going to start with the result and then I'm going <laughs> to give uh, references. So uh, you, you take a solution of this uh, wave equation. So of course, uh, there's a U like in here, okay? So you assume, for example, that it's uh, global for positive times. So you have a solution defined for all times and that uh, it remains bounded in the energy space, uniform. Then, uh, you can find uh, an integer capital J. You can find signs because uh, W can be a, a ground state, but minus W for uh, the mod U, U um, nonlinearity is also a stationary solution. So you have different signs that are possible. Uh, you can find signs for each J and scales, which decouple asymptotically as uh, T goes to infinity and uh, they travel at speed uh, uh, less than uh, the sound speed. And you can find a, a solution of the free wave equation, VL, such that your solution for large time will decompose as a sum of modulated ground states at scale lambda j, so they are decoupling, plus some linear evolution and then uh, it goes to exactly this in the energy space. So the, the, the remainder is like a little O of one in the energy space. If uh, you assume that your solution blows up in finite time and that um, the norm in the energy space uh, remains uh, uniformly bonded up to the uh, time of explosion, then you have a, a similar uh, decomposition. So um, of, sometimes it's referred to as type two, but okay. Uh, it just means that you stay uh, uniformly bonded in your uh, energy space. Okay. And uh, in fact, there's a closely related uh, theorem, which is a rigidity theorem. So if I consider this time a solution of this wave equation, so again in six dimensions and for the u square mod u, u nonlinearity, uh, then if this solution is uh, global for t goes to plus infinity and t goes to uh, minus infinity, that it remains bounded and I assume that it does not emit any radiation, which is this assumption here, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in uh, the proof. Uh, so uh, what it means is that, so I have my solution, and uh, in any exterior of a cone that I can look at, so if I have my time direction here, my direction of space here, as soon as I look in the exterior of a wave cone, say, which is uh, here. Asymptotically, as t goes to infinity, my solution will be zero. So I assume that. So it means that it's non-radiative. It means that uh, for someone traveling at the speed uh, of uh, sound, exactly, uh, he does not see anything of the solution. He does not see uh, any information on the solution asymptotically. Uh, then, such solutions, they are very rigid. And the only such solutions are either on the zero solution, the stationary state, or minus the stationary state. Of course, minus the stationary state is not possible if you just have the u square nonlinearity, it's just for the mod u, u nonlinearity. And so, uh, why is this theorem called uh, the non existence of a pure multisoliton? It's that, so if you come back to my previous theorem, the previous theorem tells you that whenever you have this assumption here, you are a sum of modulated uh, solitons at infinity plus some solution of the linear wave equation. And if you are non-radiative, this means that the solution of the linear equation called the radiation is the zero solution. So your radiation is zero. So the assumptions I'm making in theorem two, using theorem one, imply that my solution, both at t goes, as t goes to minus infinity and t goes to plus infinity, 
can be decomposed uh, under this form, like, uh, like this. And uh, this is not possible. So uh, this is a pure multisoliton. It's like just asymptotically a sum of modulated solitons plus a zero, say. And this is not possible uh, for, there are no non-trivial multisoliton. As soon as you put two solitons or more, uh, they will create some radiation. Okay, so these are the two results. Uh, and now I'm gonna talk about the related results. So of course, one could ask- So uh, yeah. Charles, can I ask a question? I mean, like, I think yeah. I asked the same question yesterday to Yannick. So uh, any kind of stability about these two results, like stability, meaning that if you perturb the initial data, can you say anything? Not really, no. No, uh, because- yeah, You uh, think like nothing remains, like- uh, Of course, uh, so I believe that uh, whatever solution you could construct that would exist, uh, would have a um, stability up to a finite uh, co-dimensional set. Uh -huh. um, but it's hard to prove, I would say. So the only such- no, But I result, think I think like if you take yeah. the first result, your first result, so if you take two initial datas, I mean, you yeah. can apply the same result to both of them, I guess, right? Yes, yes. But the so problem then, is that- uh, so Then the two decomposition ensure. may be completely different, right? That's somehow the point, like the two decomposition. Yes, yes because maybe one soliton disappears, for example. And mm -hmm. If you had 10 solitons for the first solution, then you just have nine for the other one. And uh, you have also this assumption that the solution remains bounded in the energy space, which is, you know, you have to prove that Okay, so you are taking a particular perturbation which ensures this assumption is still valid. Uh, no, but okay, no, but you can you can try to prove this under putting some assumptions. Yeah, I mean, like you can yes. put assumption that both are okay. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, it may be worth like seeing what kind of assumption you can put so that you keep more or less the same kind of representation. That's true. So in a sense, this has been uh, worked out uh, completely in the case of uh, one stationary state. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So this is this result of uh, Krieger, Nakanishi, and Schlag that I'm mentioning here. Mm. So uh, for, for the audience now, I'm describing uh, some particular solutions which uh, uh, give certain dynamics uh, related to my theorem. So. Uh, there exists a manifold in uh, the, the energy space of solutions which uh, are going to, okay, so, okay, uh, in fact, uh, I don't know why I put scattering, it's like, it's modified. Here, I forgot to put my scale lambda, there's a typo. So, um, so there exist like solutions which uh, can be decomposed as a, a stationary state plus some linear radiation. And this has been completely understood by uh, Krieger and Akinichi and Schleich. Uh, earlier, there were works by Ginevra Sofer Velo, which could like completely settle the small data case. And uh, you have um, scattering for small data because the nonlinear effects uh, basically they vanish and you uh, become uh, a linear wave. So there are solutions with no soliton, solutions with one soliton. And uh, Jacek Rendresch uh, proved that there exist solutions uh, with two solitons. And uh, as you can see, it's a pure multi soliton as t goes to infinity. Uh, and this is for dimension six. In other dimensions, uh, other solutions have been constructed. Uh, for example, you can have like uh, explicit examples of uh, solitons which are um, concentrating in infinite time or spreading in infinite time by Krieger Schlag and Krieger Dunninger. Um, if you are in the non radial case, you can use uh, the Lorentz transform to produce from this static soliton uh, traveling waves. They start to move if you apply the Lorentz transform. And uh, you can like produce solutions which are a sum of different uh, traveling waves. This has been done by Martin Bell and Jan. 
And uh, you have also uh, two multi-solitons uh, done by uh, Genrich. And uh, regarding the soliton resolution conjecture, so of course, like I put my uh, theorem in a very rough way, I didn't do an introduction, but in fact, uh, this uh, resolution, this uh, conjecture is like somewhat a, a deep conjecture in uh, the realm of uh, evolution PDs. So I will formulate it uh, this way, which is maybe not the usual formulation of it. But uh, to me, I would say that uh, any, uh, not necessarily global, any solution of uh, many evolution equation, uh, if you go to its maximal interval uh, of uh, existence uh, time, so if you go to capital T, that can be either plus infinity or finite. It can be always decomposed uh, as a sum of particular solutions, which are self-similar. Uh, so it's the leading part of the solution uh, plus some remainder. And so what do I mean by self-similar solutions? So here I mean it in a very uh, weak sense, in the sense that it just means that it can be obtained at a later time. It's a particular solution that can be obtained by a self-similar transformation using just the, the group of invariants of your equation uh, from the initial data. So it's a solution which has a very particular trajectory which can be obtained from the initial data just by the action of a one-dimensional subgroup. And uh, okay, it's believed that for many equations, the, this should be the case. So if I just restrict to the nonlinear wave equation, uh, and I assume that uh, I remain bounded in the energy space, then I'm ruling out uh, many of these uh, other self-similar solutions which could appear. If I'm in the radial case, uh, in fact, there's only one nonlinear object. So this is why we are proving this conjecture in this particular case. It's because Basically, there is only one interesting object, which is uh, this uh, ground state W. And so uh, the uh, soliton resolution conjecture uh, for the nonlinear wave equation for uh, solutions which remain bonded in the energy space is just that asymptotically, you evolve as a sum of uh, decoupled either by uh, scale if you're in the radial uh, setting or also by uh, their center of uh, mass if you are in the non-radial case, uh, plus some radiation term. So there's a long history for this uh, problem. And uh, I'm going to mention uh, the early uh, numerical experiments done uh, by uh, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam in 55, then uh, other uh, results by Zabuski and Pruskal. And uh, this was first seen for uh, completely integrable equations. Uh, basically, for completely integrable equations, you have like uh, ways to uh, transform your uh, phase space of solutions uh, into, uh, into a set of new coordinates somehow. And this allows for like easy, for explicit computation somehow. And so you can see that uh, if you put two solitons for this uh, completely integrable equations that I'm mentioning, uh, then uh, they will uh, interact, but in an elastic way. So they interact, but after their collision, uh, they have the same speed and they do not emit radiation, which is not the case uh, if you consider a non-integrable equation. So somehow for non-integrable equation, you, you still suspect the solution, the soliton resolution conjecture to be true, but you suspect this pure multisoliton uh, not to exist. And so this is the inelastic uh, collision conjecture is that uh, if you consider the, um, the nonlinear uh, wave equation, the critical one, then there should not be any pure multisoliton in the sense that I defined earlier, that in the sense that it's like in both time directions and uh, that you do not emit uh, radiation. Okay. So um, there, are mean, there have been many results now for the soliton resolution conjecture. And in fact, the theorem I was mentioning uh, had uh, analogs uh, in uh, many dimensions by uh, my co-authors, uh, Thomas Ducaire, Carlos Koenig, and Frank Merle. So it started in uh, three dimensions, uh, then they obtained the results in five dimensions, and uh, then uh, they obtained the results in four dimensions uh, together with uh, Yvon Martel. 
And uh, I really uh, need to emphasize that our work somehow uses uh, a kind of uh, many techniques from this work in uh, other dimensions. And uh, to reach dimension six, there was some uh, heavy um, obstructions uh, that I'm gonna speak about when I'm gonna talk about the proof. So uh, there were like similar results for uh, the wave maps. Uh, so there are other wave equations that I'm gonna discuss now. Uh, so I hope that my uh, bibliography is a bit, uh, uh, contains uh, all the authors. Uh, so there are the co-rotational wave maps. Uh, so it has been uh, obtained uh, by uh, Dwickert's uh, koenig martel merle as a byproduct of their uh, unequal uh, for paper. Then uh, you can consider uh, many other equations and uh, I will mention some, uh, among all these works, I will mention some uh, recent work of uh, Schendrich and Lurie uh, of last year, where they obtain uh, the full uh, soliton resolution conjecture uh, in all equivariant classes uh, for the uh, critical uh, wave maps problem. And uh, they use uh, some techniques which are of a different kind. Uh, so I think that now we have like uh, different ways to attack this problem. Uh, okay, so. Uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit uh, the novelties uh, in uh, the study uh, of this equation. As I was mentioning, um, so our proof, it uses uh, some um, conceptual ideas of uh, the case of odd dimensions. And um, I cannot really talk about the whole proof uh, for 30 minutes. So I just decided to focus on what's new. So um, this might deter at first people which are not familiar with these issues in the audience, but uh, I think that you should still uh, try to, okay, to, to listen because uh, I, I hope I, I can give something which is a bit self-contained. So unfortunately it will be only a, a, part, a part of the proof, but uh, I hope it can be of interest for everyone. So uh, one first result is uh, the faraway classification of non-radiative solutions. So I stated two theorems, which are theorem one and theorem two, uh, one for the decomposition, uh, the soliton resolution, and the, the other one for the non-existence of pure multisolitons. And in fact, uh, they are closely related in the proof. Even if we do not like really use uh, theorem two to prove theorem one, but in fact, he, the proof of theorem two somehow is the uh, backbone of the proof of theorem one, and we use the same proof to prove uh, both results. So what is a non-radiative solution? I already talked about that, but here I'm gonna talk about it again. So a non-radiative solution, uh, it's a solution, so I will stick to now with the U square nonlinearity because it's analytic uh, to his, uh, the presentation. So. Uh, you, you consider a solution in the sense that it's in, a, in the energy space uh, four times, and uh, you consider it only outside some exterior wave cone. So what it means is that, so here you see I have my diagram. So I have my space direction here. I have my time direction here. And I'm only considering my solution uh, on the exterior of some uh, wave cone. So, I'm only considering my solution here. And I will say that it's non-radiative here if when I look at uh, its uh, energy, it goes to zero in both time directions because my equation is time reversible. Uh, and why is this a well-defined concept? it's because I have finite speed of propagation. And so if two solutions, they are equal initially here, for example, so past capital R, they will remain equal uh, for R greater than capital R plus absolute value of T. Uh, and so, 
if you remember, my second theorem was telling you that there were no pure, uh, that the only solutions which satisfy that, in fact, are uh, W minus W and zero, if such solutions are global. So the idea is that since we have finite speed of propagation, we can study the solution far away. And uh, if we are far away, then it's somehow a small data result because the energy becomes small. And so in a sense, nonlinear effects should be smaller. Uh, and so this is done uh, with this uh, like new result is that um, in dimension six, if you are far away and you wonder uh, how many non-radiative solutions there are in the radial case, then uh, we can answer this uh, position, that uh, this um, question. There are only two such solutions up to time and scale transformations, because you can uh, like represent uh, non-radiative solutions in uh, an explicit uh, way. So, so there is this and that. So you have uh, logs, you have uh, uh, the the variable t over r, which plays a crucial role. And uh, if you try to, to find a solution under this form, uh, you end up with uh, inductive formulas to compute uh, your polynomials uh, A, I, N, and you can do so. And so uh, the thing is that uh, far away, there are only uh, two really uh, non-radiative solutions, either your ground state, or you have another solution which is starting to leading order with this behavior. So it behaves like LT over R4. And now it's a first step in understanding like the global problem is that when you have to rule out the existence of pure uh, global multisolitons, you know that at infinity, you must behave like this solution. So either at infinity, you behave like a uh, soliton, in which case it's, in the good direction because our rigidity results prove that it's the only solution, uh, that these are the only such solutions, or your solution, in fact, at infinity uh, resembles uh, this other non-radiative solution. And then what we prove actually is that there is no way to reconnect this uh, non-radiative solution at infinity into a globally regular solution at zero. Uh, okay, and so uh, this first proposition says that uh, we have uh, explicit solutions that are non-radiative, and then we have uh, this result which says that if you consider any non-radiative solution, uh, then it is equal to uh, such solutions. So we completely classify uh, the non-radiative solutions, uh, but far away, because in a sense, uh, because uh, in a sense we have to uh, uh, make the nonlinear effects small. So uh, I will not go into the proof because uh, it would take too much time. But uh, so this was like an open question left uh, after the work uh, on the odd dimensions by uh, Dukert, Koenig, and Merle, whether or not uh, such solutions they existed and whether or not they could be classified. And so uh, the main issue is that uh, we don't have like useful, uh, we, we are lacking dispersive estimates for this problem. So I was saying that far away, the nonlinear effects, they are small. That's true because the energy is somehow small, but the good properties of your linear dynamics are also weak because there is uh, counter examples to certain estimates and also there is a, a resonance. And this resonance somehow like destroys your good dispersive effects. And so even if your nonlinear effects, they are small, maybe they could still compete with the if, uh, with the problem linked with the resonance. And so, okay, I'm not saying much more than that, but this was like the cruci crucial points in the proof of these two propositions. I mean, of this uh, second proposition, classifying this. 
And so now I will uh, spend, okay, the second part of my talk, uh, uh, mainly like the last uh, 20 minutes, uh, to explain the new channels of energy estimate around the ground state. I was saying that uh, in order to um, uh, classify things and to study your solution, plus to a soliton, a multi-soliton, you need some specific uh, estimates for the linearized evolution plus to this nonlinear object. And um, there were like uh, an estimate which was uh, lacking in even dimension. And so we found an alternative one, which is uh, the second novelty after the classification of the far away non radiative solutions. So uh, what is this problem of uh, understanding uh, the channels of energy and the radiation fields? So uh, I think that here, like everyone can understand that even if you are not like familiar with these wave equations, is that there is a, a, a nice typical behavior for the linear wave equation. So it's a linear property. It's that if you study a solution, so again, uh, on the exterior of uh, a wave can, so you, you study it uh, really like somehow you move with the speed of sound, okay? So you move like uh, plus t. <laughs> um, then you, you will find asymptotically a, a kind of one dimensional behavior in the sense that uh, you start with an initial data, which is uh, u0 and its partial derivative at initial time. And as you go to either plus infinity or minus infinity, in this uh, variable, which is like the variable uh, r minus t, uh, so it's the distance from the wave cone uh, starting from the origin at the origin of time and space, you will have some one dimensional behavior because your uh, energy uh, vector, so dru dtu, it will converge to uh, a fixed function of just the distance to the wave cone. And so you start with this, uh, say, uh, multidimensional uh, solution and you encounter some kind of uh, self-similarity. Like you have some kind of simplification occurring at infinity for the wave equation. So th this theory, uh, it uh, originates uh, in the 60s. So this was proved by uh, Friedlander in a series of papers in 62. And then it was uh, revived by uh, Dukers, Koenig, and Merl uh, in uh, the year 2016. So there are uh, several borderline cases, like what happens, for example, in dimension two. Uh, I'm not going to go into details because in dimension six, uh, it's contained in the paper of Dukers, Koenig, and Merl. And I'm just going to say that recently it has been um, a fruitful line of uh, work because uh, so we are using certain results uh, by Li, Shen, and Wei because there's a beautiful algebra, for example, if you want to compute uh, how G plus and G minus are related, which is a, a scattering result, like you have explicit formulas, uh, seeing the dimension, uh, etc and even some more recent results. Uh, then Jean-Marc Delors has also a, a result regarding uh, where the energy uh, will go for uh, this problem. And there is also a, a result by um, Raphael Cott and Camille Laurent. Uh, so as I was saying, the interesting thing is that- so, so, uh, yeah. Ch Charles, I mean, can, yeah. can you go back again? Like yeah. In your statement, you said, okay, it becomes one dimensional, but somehow, somehow, okay, I'm, I'm not understanding. I mean, when you say it's one dimensional, it's because of that behavior R minus absolute value of T, like the, the, yes. the object G plus and G minus, right? Yes, it's that first you have two independent variables, which are T and R, and for the did limiting you, did you, problem, it's just uh, one variable. Right. Yes, uh, so did you say anything about uh, R plus and R minus, or they can be any? I mean, what, 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 uh, G plus and G minus. What are G plus and G minus? Uh, I'm going to answer that uh, in the next slide. Okay. In fact, G plus and G minus, neither it can be anything because it's okay. an isometry. So uh, given any radiation field at infinity, 
in L2, you can find the solution of the wave equation, which will uh, be this uh, radiation, uh, which will emit this radiation. And so this is why I think that there's a beautiful structure for this problem, right? Uh, it's, uh, okay. it's a super nice thing. So it's an isometry. And not only because uh, since there is finite speed of propagation, so if uh, I give you the initial data here, it will determine entirely the initial data for uh, R greater than capital R plus T. And so in the end, it will determine entirely my radiation field for rho greater than R. And so uh, if I just consider the radiation uh, past some fixed number capital R, uh, its L2 norm is controlled by the initial energy for X greater than capital R. And you may ask, uh, how much information can I retrieve for my initial data from what I have emitted at infinity? So I consider the information here. I go also backwards in time and I consider the information at minus infinity. I put these two informations together. So algebraically, I compute like the two L2 norms and I put them together. And I ask whether or not this quantity, uh, somehow, I, I don't know if I can say it's an observability problem like for people in control, but it's like, so uh, is this quantity uh, controlling my initial energy after this uh, fixed uh, uh, distance capital R. And uh, so this question is the question of uh, channels of energy estimates. So <clears throat> if you are in odd dimensions, uh, uh, sorry, yes. So if you are in uh, odd dimensions, uh, there are two distinct cases to distinguish. So either, your exterior wave cone starts at the origin, in which case you will see the whole uh, initial data, or it starts outside the origin and somehow there is some missing information if you want. And uh, in the case that uh, you start at the origin, then it's true because, uh, well, uh, okay, it, it's true if you are in odd dimensions. So what you will see at infinity will entirely determine what you had initially. However, if you start outside some ball uh, for R strictly greater than zero, you have solutions which do not emit radiation. And the problem is that these are linear solutions. So these are solutions that, as I said, if you travel with the speed of sound, then at some time you will not see anything anymore of this solution. Though it still has some energy which is conserved, but the energy will be conserved, uh, say, at uh, a shorter distance to the origin. And so you have uh, a finite dimensional set that I'm not going to describe, but I will show it to you uh, in six dimensions of solutions which are non radiative. So of course, these solutions, they cannot exist for R equals zero, right? Because of the first result. And so they are singular somehow at zero, but they are completely fine at infinity. And uh, such solutions, they emit no radiation. And so this was my way to state initially that I do not emit, emit radiation for the pure multisoliton, but now that I introduced you with this theory of radiation fields, this just means that my radiation field is zero past uh, capital R. And the thing is that uh, you still have this, uh, say, observability estimate, uh, but outside this uh, set of counter examples, uh, which is that if you project, so pi zero is the projection in uh, H dot one and pi one is the projection in uh, L2. If you project your initial data outside this set, in L2 of uh, x greater than r, then it's still true that uh, what you see at infinity will control your initial data. So you still have the somehow this kind of isometry property that I said 
uh, which somehow holds due to finite uh, speed of propagation, it's still true in odd dimensions if you are on the orthogonal set of certain uh, very specific non relative solutions, which are uh, of a finite dimension. And so uh, the drawing, I think, is like this, is that uh, so initially you can control your solution from the radiation fields at infinity, and you have only a very finite specific number of particular solutions, which, okay, their energy, in fact, it will not really travel at speed uh, one, and it will go a bit uh, behind. And so these non radiative solutions at, as in, at infinity, they just produce zero. So they, their energy can be seen a bit before. And this is because you were lacking some information here. Okay. Uh, and so in even dimensions, as I was saying, so there is a problem. So this is uh, why uh, the case of the soliton resolution conjecture in dimension six uh, was uh, still open. It's because then uh, you, you have uh, one estimate which is true, which is that you can control uh, the partial derivative with time of your initial data, but you have another one which uh, fades. Okay. Uh, and so this is bad. You don't have this uh, somehow observability uh, estimate. Uh, and then for this problem uh, of uh, the radiation past some exterior cone, which is like greater than the origin, so uh, R greater than zero, the same thing happens. So you still have counter examples. So now I, I give them uh, explicitly to you. So I have one over R4 which is the uh, behavior at infinity of my stationary state. Uh, remember that. You have uh, another solution, which is T R to the minus one fourth. And these are like a fine non relative solution of the linear wave equation. Uh, the problem is that even if you remove these solutions in the sense that you uh, take the projection of your initial data outside the, the set, then uh, only the channels of energy estimate for the DT part of your solution is true, but the channel of energy for the U0 part of your initial data will not be true. And in fact, it will fail on any uh, set uh, with a finite co-dimension. So it uh, really fails. And the problem is that you have this resonance. So this solution is like a it's unclear whether or not to say that it's non-radiative because its uh, energy is like infinite, both close to the origin and away at infinity, but it's like it has some non-radiative behavior and it just misses critically the energy space. And you can construct the counter examples based on this uh, explicit non-radiative solution. Okay, so uh, to sum up, uh, there is this nice theory which allows you to compute what happens uh, from, at zero from what you see at infinity after your exterior of uh, the wave cone. But unfortunately, in even dimensions, uh, it fails. Now you can upgrade a little bit this discussion because, of course, we want to prove a soliton resolution conjecture. So, is this true, this uh, discussion? Is this true if we are in the neighborhood of a, a soliton? Uh, so soliton means a ground state form. So uh, if I take the potential uh, of the linearization around the soliton, uh, then I have an explicit zero, which is due to this presence of uh, um, scaling invariance. So I know what is the zero of my linearized operator. I have some specific uh, direction, which is in the energy space, it's perfect. Uh, and I have an explicit formula for it. And of course, this zero is like a natural uh, non-radiative solution. So again, this zero, if I take uh, a solution on this uh, kernel of the linearized operator uh, at initial time, far away from it, I don't have my observability uh, estimate. And so uh, this is a, a result the, which was obtained by uh, Dukas, Koenig, and Merle in their proof of the soliton resolution for uh, uh, odd dimensions, it's that you have two particular non-radiative solutions, uh, lambda w and t lambda w. But outside these solutions, 
if you project on the orthogonal complement, then you can still have an information on your initial data from what you saw at infinity. So uh, if I make my uh, drawing, it's that I need to go all the way up to R equals zero to avoid uh, this um, uh, singular counter examples at zero. But so if I start with capital R equals zero for the prime of the linearized problem around the ground state, then what I see at infinity will entirely determine what I see at zero uh, up to uh, just two directions, which are the natural zeros of my equation. So uh, the thing is that uh, we came up with a, another a similar estimate uh, in six dimensions. So uh, the thing is that I already told you that there are estimates which fail already just for the free uh, wave equation in six dimensions. So we could not like prove the same estimate as for odd dimensions because uh, basically uh, we know there are counter examples. But uh, what we prove is the following is that uh, you can, we can logarithmically uh, your uh, energy space for the bad direction, which is like the U uh, at time zero direction. And so uh, you just um, take some weight and uh, you take a sup over, so this quantity basically, it means that I'm doing a dyadic partition. It's equivalent to doing a dyadic partition and to having uh, the estimate you would uh, expect from the Hardy inequality, but you actually weaken it a little bit and you add some logarithmic. So it's like a Hardy with logarithmic weakening. So you note that this space uh, UZ it's actually, uh, this norm is controlled by this norm here. And this norm here is controlled by uh, the energy norm just by an application of the Hardy inequality. And so uh, what we prove is that uh, if you study your problem uh, close to the ground state for the linearized problem close to the ground state in six dimensions, in fact, you can control the direction that had some problems before, but uh, in this logarithmically weakened norm. Uh, and so this estimate, okay, it's new. And uh, I think it's quite interesting because uh, basically um, this estimate, uh, there is no analog really for the free wave equation because the fact that we put a potential, it creates a scale for the problem. So we have this scale one and we can determine the logarithmic distance to uh, this uh, R equal one uh, scale. Uh, but for the free evolution, it's a scale-free problem. So we see that uh, it cannot be true. And it's really linked to the fact that they don't have like the same resonances, the uh, free problem and the other problem. And uh, of course, one may wonder, so why is this logarithmic weakening here? Is there something else that's possible? So in fact, what I conjecture is that uh, in, you could weaken it to log to the one half, but even not reaching one half. Uh, uh, and this should be optimal. But the thing is that we can construct counter examples which grow logarithmically like log to the alpha with alpha uh, strictly greater than one half. So really this log is like almost optimal. Uh, okay. And so uh, with the remaining uh, time that I have, I will go a little bit in the proof of this. So uh, the proof, it starts with establishing uh, uniform estimates uh, for the good, say, direction for the channel of energy estimates uh, in the exterior of the wave cone. So I will take an, a solution of my linearized wave equation, and I will ask whether I can have estimates for UT everywhere in the exterior of my wave cone. So on in all these lines. And the answer is yes. So I have such an estimate. I can control the energy on any of such lines by what I see at infinity, which is my radiations G plus and G minus. Okay. So I can control my solution everywhere. So I do a, a uniform estimates, but everywhere in the exterior of the wave cone. Uh, and to do that, uh, we employ a strategy which uh, was already somewhat present uh, in uh, the paper of uh, Dukerskunigangmer, which is to say that uh, we identify what are the counterexamples 
and we do a rigidity result. So the only counterexamples, in fact, are these specific lambda w uh, directions. Uh, then we mix this uh, qualitative estimates with a quantitative estimate, which is uh, the uh, channels of energy estimate of uh, Kurt Koenig and Schlag. And we combine them with some compactness argument, and then we prove this result. Okay, so we have estimates for UT everywhere because UT was the good direction for the channels of energy estimate for the nonlinear wave equation. So now how do we manage uh, to deal with the direction which was bad, which was the U direction? So in fact, uh, we write an elliptic equation for the initial data as a function with forcing, which is just DTU. And so uh, this is done in two lemmas. So uh, if you solve, so this is just an identity, the first lemma is that if you solve the linear wave equation with potential, then you have an elliptic equation for your initial data. And this elliptic equation is of the following form. You have minus uh, Laplace n plus V of something which is your initial data and something else which only depends on DTU. And you have a forcing which only depends on DTU. So if you want, if you know your partial derivative with time everywhere on the exterior of a wave cone, uh, you can recover your initial data. And you can uh, lift estimates that you had for UT to estimates that you had for U0. So I wasn't really aware of such things. So we had to, to find a way to, to do such estimates. And I think it's one novelty of the paper. And so once you have this uh, elliptic equation, then you can just like employ uh, elliptic estimates. And so if you have this equation, which is in fact satisfied by your initial data, huh, and you have like specific estimates for your forcing terms, then you can estimate uh, the solution of your elliptic equation. So the thing is really to obtain information from U0 uh, for U0 from the partial derivative with time of U everywhere on the exterior of the wave cone. And so, uh, in fact, it goes with this formula. It's that uh, if you start with the free wave equation, then you have this identity for any time t0, which is just like the application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so uh, already it's true for just the free wave equation that you can write an elliptic equation out of your, uh, uh, for your initial data as a function with forcings depending on the partial derivative with time. Um, and the thing is that you have to choose your time T0 wisely. And you have to choose T0 wisely depending on where you are in space. So what we do is that we decompose in uh, exterior dyadic cells. So we do this elliptic equation on dyadic cells here. And we obtain elliptic equations for each dyadic cells. Then we have to remove the zeros, which are the bad directions. And we have to glue all this dyadic equation into a single one. And so it involves, of course, uh, computing what are the commutator when you localize your dyadic equations, et cetera. And uh, what is really interesting is that uh, by, with the fact that you have zeros, that you have to include zero directions, uh, which are the counterexamples for the uh, linear uh, channel of energy estimates for the UT directions uh, somewhere else in your wave cone, this makes the logarithm appear uh, when you see this elliptic equation. So in fact, so you have certain coefficients which come here. And uh, when you try to estimate these coefficients, you have some logs which appear. Uh, OK, so I'm going to just uh, mention that once you have an estimate close to a soliton, you can lift it as an estimate to a multi-soliton. And so if you were solving your wave equation on, uh, with a potential, which is the one uh, produced by uh, several solitons, uh, then you still have this estimate. And the thing is that uh, this logarithmic distance uh, has to be taken with respect to the scales, to the closest scale of a soliton. And so you can transform this weakened channel of energy estimate to uh, near one soliton to one near a multi-soliton.
and you produce some uh, error term due to the fact that uh, they are not completely separated, but they still uh, interact a little bit. Okay, so I think uh, that's uh, it's all, and I'm gonna thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sharon. It was a very, very nice. Uh, it's a very nice result. Um, let me ask: Are there any questions or comments in the audience? So okay. uh, <laughs> maybe a question, uh, Charles. Uh, like the difference uh, again. Like the, can you re-explain? I think to everyone, like the difference between odd and even dimension in this kind of stories, like how it is related to uh, uh, to the radiation and so on. Uh, even yes. forgetting about this, even forgetting about the result you are explaining, but. What is fundamentally different between the odd and even dimensions? Uh, so what is fundamentally different is uh, really the presence uh, of uh, a resonance at infinity. So somehow, if you look away from the origin, And you ask what are the solutions which uh, do not uh, uh, this, uh, which uh, do not emit radiations. So if you have the odd dimensions, then all these solutions somehow they are like uh, they can be written uh, like uh, r to the negative alpha uh, t over r to the power beta, right? Uh, and you have like uh, exponents that you can find for that. I mean, it's combinations of such things. And the thing is that uh, they are all such, uh, it's okay, so these are uh, counter examples. Uh, and by counter example, may, maybe I'm not, uh, as you want me to be like a bit, uh, uh, clear on that. So these are uh, non-radiative solutions, but uh, they are however, they are in the energy space. And uh, so if you want, uh, you, you have, uh, if you remove them, all the other solutions are radiative. But in even dimension, so say n equals six, there is this solution, which is uh, R, minus two, uh, minus two T R minus four. Uh, and this solution, it misses the energy space. And so the thing is that uh, since it's almost there, you have many uh, estimates which fail. So uh, in fact, there were two things which failed. It's that one thing which failed was the channel of energy estimate, which I spent some time discussing how to retrieve another estimate. Uh, and so you have to do this logarithmic weakening and so on. But another thing that fails is that uh, when you try to classify the asymptotic behavior at, at infinity, uh, you could believe that this solution would survive at the nonlinear level. Since the linear effects are very weak on this solution, uh, you, you could believe that there would exist 
a nonlinear perturbation of this solution, which would actually be non-radiative. And uh, I think that really it's, uh, it was a, a very heavy part of the proof that I did not have time to discuss to prove that if a solution which is non-radiative for the full nonlinear wave equation starts to resemble this bad solution on some uh, dyadic uh, cell, then it uh, was not allowed to um, belong to the energy space. So you have really to, to find a way to state that this uh, resonance it does not survive at the nonlinear level as well. But it's really, it's very tricky somehow. I, I hope it answers your question. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, maybe a small question, Charles. Do you think you, if you take P uh, for the nonlinear wave equation, let's say yeah. in the case of blow up, do you think we can do something similar? You don't have global existence like here for the for the wave. Uh, so, so if I can, if I take p, uh, what do you mean by p? Because so, here your your nonlinearity is quadratic, right? Yes. It's used. If you take uh, another power for the nonlinearity. Well, then the equation is either subcritical or supercritical, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a completely different story because. Uh, in the radial case, there are no stationary solutions with finite energy. Uh, Said differently, any stationary state has infinite, uh, no, not energy, but critical norm. And so the problem is that uh, any solution which remains bounded uniformly uh, up to its maximal time of existence, capital T, in the critical space, is global and scatters to linear waves. It has been proved by, uh, okay, so I don't want to uh, stay bad thing, but I, I know for sure for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it has been proved by Dwyker's Koenig now in the supercritical case. So the thing is that basically in the supercritical case, uh, this, these are not really uh, in, uh, you, you have to allow your critical norm to grow. And if you allow your critical norm to grow, maybe you start resembling other solutions. And so it's a completely different story, I would say. Okay, I see. Thank you, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, even the proof here for the critical case looks to be very interesting also, right? So, Thank you so much for this uh, yeah, very nice. Thanks for having uh, uh, invited me. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Then, so, so uh, may I have a, may, may I have a question for Sharp? It just, you know, in uh, I read uh, the my, my, many theorem from the Soliton conjectures that the lambda j is, they see the lambda j, but can we specify the formulation of a lambda j or no. not at all? No. No, no. Uh, so there are the results that I mentioned. So basically, uh, these results of uh, Krieger, Schlag, Krieger, Doninger, where uh, they construct uh, one bubble with explicit uh, lambda. Of course, you have all the type two blow up results that I did not yeah. mention, uh, but uh, that you know well of. And you have uh, for multiple stationary states, you have this result of uh, Gendresh. Uh, but there is no classification result, I mean, general available yet. Oh, okay, so there is one uh, if you restrict, uh, once again. Yes, you may that a formulation of lambda chai can be any or have to be specific. No, no, we, we expect rigidity. Uh, uh, we, I don't know if I should say we, but I expect rigidity at least. Okay. Uh, so this has been proved. So for example, uh, there is some uniqueness. Uh, if you take a, a pure uh, two bubble, 
like the pure two bubble of uh, uh, that there is this classification of uh, the pure two bubble of uh, generation lowering, for example, for wave maps. Okay. Uh, but as soon as you start adding radiation, maybe you can change deeply what's going on. Uh, or not, actually, I don't know. So, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I'll see you all at uh, 8 p.m. over the time uh, for the next yeah. talk. Bye. Thanks again, Charles.